So good day. So here we are again to talk about another very important plant family or group of plants that belong in the same family. And this one will begin with Griffith Park because this plant families uh, or family is gonna have a lot of members that are gonna be well represented in what is known as a California floristic province. So it would naturally would have been grown throughout what is known Southern California, including Long Beach and Orange County and most of those areas that you still find uh, some of the members growing in some of the wild or wilderness area. So it is gonna be a extremely dominant plant in the California floristic province, or at least in the coastal area. Uh, so that's why we're starting with Griffith Park. And so we get to talk about uh, the Anacardiaceae, or what is known as the cashew, because that is gonna be the type uh, specimen genus for this family, Anacardium, or sometimes known as the sumac family. And uh, as we can see with the map, it is gonna be distributed throughout most of what is known as the tropical areas. So it is well represented in tropical climates as well as going into somewhat temperate like us here. And then as it just ventures further north, it then it stops growing because then it gets too cold. So we're looking at a family of die-cut plants, broadleaves, uh, and then uh, we have about 800 plus species. We only get to see the ones that are economically important. So we do have a lot of the native plants that are gonna provide good habitat for wildlife here in California, as well as we have a few that are gonna be eaten by people in the form of fresh fruits. And then we're also gonna have a few that are gonna be used as a spice or for seasoning of food. So there is some interaction uh, with people or some dependence on people in the usage of members of this family. And so when we look at the plant family, uh, the leaves are gonna be extremely variable. So many of them or some members are gonna have compound leaves uh, with many leaflets that are gonna be quite large. Uh, or we might have simple leaves uh, that are just gonna have the petiole and the blade. Uh, or sometimes they're gonna be lobed uh, leaf uh, as in this uh, Ruslancia or the African sumac. And so the leaf, be aware, it's just gonna be variable depending on the species or which plant you might be looking at. Uh, what it is going to be common among all members of this family is the fact that we can consider them to be somewhat poisonous or somewhat uh, uh, caustic. If the sap happens to get on your skin, you may develop an allergic reaction or some kind of uh, allergy to it. It is known that many people in the world are allergic to anacards, which means they are, are gonna be allergic to members of this family, which means they cannot enjoy something as good and sweet as a mango or something as good as a pistache or pistachio because those are gonna be members of this family. And so when a person happens to have the allergies for a compound that is found within members of this family, obviously they cannot touch those plants or they may end up being in the hospital. And so the plants will have some kind of resin when they are injured, as we can see here with this California pepper that was recently cut and out of the vascular system, you can see some kind of resin, some kind of sap, something that is not gonna be good for you to get on your skin. And then if we allow that to dry out, we can see with this injured individual, uh, we can see sap that has oozed and uh, has gone down. Uh, and now it has dried out and kind of become crystallized like amber. So that is the sap that we need to be very careful. For people that are extremely sensitive to plants, just maybe touching a plant from a member of this family could be a potential problem. And then we have the extreme, uh, which is gonna be poison oak for us, uh, or poison ivy for people in the Eastern United States. That obviously 
just touching the plant and your skin coming in contact with the oils from this plant will cause your body to think that it is the end of the world and it's going to break up in rashes and a bunch of other problems. So yes, poison oak, poison sumac, poison ivy uh, will be member of members of this family and those we definitely need to be careful with. So, and here's uh, the sap, uh, the bottom portion of the previous plant. So you see where the sap has ooze just from being injured. And that's just a defense mechanism. Obviously, uh, this was made mainly for uh, insects who would happen to feed on the plant. Uh, but it ha just happens that the same compounds are going to be not good for people to touch or be come in contact with. Uh, and then if we then uh, start looking at the flowers, we're going to find that the flowers or blossoms, because they are going to be produced primarily on a shared flower stock, uh, are going to be small. Uh, they're going to be small and they're normally going to be or considered unisexual. Uh, so here we have two different specimens. And so when we look at the flowers, they're not going to be too sophisticated or they're not going to be too complex. Uh, there's going to be on the left side what we can refer to as the female flower uh, that has uh, just the carpal uh, and uh, the stigma and the style. Now we can see some remnants of some kind of stamen. So perhaps the ancestor of this plant had both uh, functional male and female comp uh, components of the flower. And then as time went by and they diversified and they evolved, uh, then they have lost the function out of one of those, uh, either the male component or the female component. And then if we look at the male flower that has very large stamens, we can still see in the middle a very small uh, ovary with a probably non-functional stigma. And so it's still there, the remnants of the female component is there, but for our purpose, because it is non, no longer functional, uh, only the stamens, then we can say that it is a male or a female flower. And that's going to be kind of across the board where you're going to have plants that are going to be producing only male functional flowers or only female functional flowers. And that's it. And that's going to be a good mechanism for diversity because that is going to ensure that plants do not self and by not selfing, that means they have to get the pollen from a different plant. And that's going to ensure that their offspring are going to be more genetically diverse and be able to survive a catastrophe or survive out there in the world much, much better. Uh, pollination is going to be simplistic. It's just going to be insects. Uh, the flowers are not sophisticated. They're not going to exclude any unwanted pollinators. So it's open for any animal that might want some pollen and some nectar, and that's who's going to visit the flower, including the hardy bee uh, that we have here in this photograph. And then we can look at the type specimen, which is going to be anacardium, type specimen for the genus. That's where the family gets its name. So this is going to be known as the cashew. Uh, it is anacardium occidentale, and this is going to be a tropical fruit uh, native to Brazil. And so here it is when uh, it was flowering and I happened to find it in flower in one of my trips to South America. And so here's the flowers. Uh, once again, uh, we have the ones that have the stigma that are functional female, and then the ones that don't that are most likely uh, male flowers. Uh, and here is what the fruit looks like. And so when we look at a cashew, we are going to notice that what is going to be the fleshy portion that is known as a cashew apple is nothing more than the swollen stem that is going to hold the seed or the fruit. Uh, so that is a swollen stem that, yes, it becomes soft and juicy, and it kind of tastes like mango, not really as good as mango, uh, but it's used in juices and a bunch of other drinks in Central and South America. The real fruit for the plant is going to be the moon shape, uh, the moon shape seed slash fruit uh, that will be the component of the fruit. So that is being held by this cashew apple that 
The cashew apple will serve as a purpose for attracting an animal. In this case, it's gonna be primarily monkeys that are gonna grow for the fruit. And the monkeys will carry the fruit and take it somewhere else where they're gonna eat the fruit and then drop the seeds. The seeds on a raw cashew apple or cashew plant are gonna have a lot of toxins. So you don't want to bite into it because you're gonna regret it. Uh, it is customary for people to roast the seeds. And when you roast them, it is very important that you do it in the open air. Because if you happen to breathe the smoke of a roasted cashew, it's gonna be similar to uh, breathing in uh, smoke uh, of poison oak that is going to get into your lungs and then you may have a systemic reaction of in your body which is not going to be pretty and it's not going to be easy to treat so make sure that if you ever get come across rock cashews and you're going to roast them it's going to be done in an open air environment uh, and here's the cashew apple as it's been devoured by a nice beetle. And so we see the cashew fruit uh, right here. Uh, and uh, it is available for sale. Now, unfortunately, the fruit does not have a good shelf life. So once it ripens, it becomes very soft. And then, uh, so most often it has to be eaten fresh where it's native to. Otherwise, if you happen to go to several markets, you may find it in the frozen fruit aisle. You can add it to your smoothies, you can get the seeds if you want, uh, and you can enjoy it if you have not done so. And then the seeds get processed, and that's where they get the actual seed, uh, which is going to be the uh, cashew nuts, as they are referred. But once again, be careful, because if you know you have an allergic reaction to mangoes, you probably should not be eating cashews or any other member of this family. Uh, and then the other very important ornamental plant that we are going to see around here is going to be the genus Skinnis, or it's going to be the pepper trees. And there's going to be several of them around. Uh, here's uh, some of the larger individuals that are going to have a nice uh, leaf and uh, small flowers. So here we have the tiny flowers uh, for this individual. And here's a Brazilian pepper uh, with uh, the flowers that... Uh, so going to be very tiny and so it is the fruits or uh, the tiny uh, fruits that are going to be treated as a type of pepper so yes you can purchase a product uh, that is nothing more than uh, either california or brazilian pepper under the name of pink pepper uh, and then uh, you grind it up uh, just like black pepper and you can use it to spice up your food uh, or for seasoning anything else that you want. And uh, sometimes, depending on where you go, there might be a mixture. So here's a mixture of uh, the common black pepper with pink peppers and a few other plants that have a pepper corn like fruit. So the caution here is that obviously there is a pink pepper and on a card. And so for somebody who's not aware or may not see it and they are allergic to mangoes, if they happen to eat this, obviously they're going to break into some kind of rash or worse, they're going to have to be taken to the hospital. Uh, so be very careful. But yes, it is used as a spice uh, in many, many countries, including here in Long Beach. You can find it in some of the market. And then a few other more obscure individuals here at Rotosphera, uh, one of the few trees that we're going to find uh, growing. This one is growing at Elysian Park, which is uh, the Southern California First Arboretum by Dodger Stadium. And uh, this one happens to be a male plant, and I have never seen, I think there might be a female at the LA Zoo, but I have not seen any other trees around here. Uh, but more common and most popular is going to be the mango, or the genus Mangifera that is native to India, or uh, tropical India, the Middle East, uh, that entire uh, area. Uh, and so here we have a very large tree. Uh, when it starts to bear flowers, the flowers are going to be very small. Uh, once they get either male or female, sometimes mixed together, 
uh, and then the fruit will ripen and that obviously going to give you a very nice and sweet fruit. Now, mango has gone through a lot of selections and a lot of hybridization. And so we do have an assortment of many, many mangoes out there. There's only a few that are exported or imported into the United States. So we only get one or two that are not the best mangoes in the world, but it's all what their people want and or the only thing they can bring. Uh, but if you ever get a chance to travel and go to other countries where there might be some mangoes from the area, you'll be amazed how nice and better uh, those mangoes are compared to the ones that we get here in the United States. Uh, so here's just the two standard, either the Kent mango on the left or the Manila mango on the right. Those would be what you would find here. A few other obscure individuals here and there, but pretty much if you have gotten a mango in the United States, it's either one or this two. And so if you ever travel, this comes from the spice, uh, fruit and spice park in Miami. And they are known for having over 150 varieties of mango. And I like the rules. If the mango or any fruit is on the ground, you are welcome to pick it and eat it. And so mangoes like this that are very good as far as flavor, but they're not appealing to the eye. There's spots, there's blotches, and most people will probably not get, uh, pick them off of the shelf because they don't look pretty. But inside is going to be very, very good mango. Uh, and so here is uh, another one, grow, another variety just growing out of the tree. Uh, so once again, it's not appealing to the eye, uh, but it is a much better mango than what you get here. So here's just the, some mangoes being uh, uh, displayed and for sale at some of the markets. Uh, this one happened to be in Mexico. And uh, in my trip to Mexico, I made it a very made it uh, promise myself that I would try every single mango that I could find, including some of this uh, and uh, some of those that are going to be a lot smaller. And so here's just a for scale with a pen, uh, the five different mangoes that I happened to eat in just one trip in Chiapas that I found just looking around the different markets that were there. Uh, and so this the five mangoes, you cannot get them in the States because obviously they're not going to be as desirable as the previous ones. Uh, but mangoes have many, many uses. So in certain countries, they have developed the taste for green mangoes. Uh, and so here's a picture uh, from Trinidad and Tobago where they've been, been sold uh, in a bag. Uh, and so what has happened is that mangoes are obviously a tropical fruit where they grow in areas where there's going to be a lot of fruit flies. And so when a mango starts to ripen, they are going to immediately get uh, flies that are going to deposit the eggs so that when you pick a ripe mango from the tree and you bite into it, most likely you're going to find maggots all over the mango. And so people had to figure out ways of still using or eating the mango without having to eat a lot of maggots. And so that's when people started to harvest them when they are green and they're not appealing to the fruit fly because it's not ready for them to eat. And so over time, the desire and the taste for green mango became the norm. And now many countries, including Cambodia, uh, will now eat mangoes when they are green. And sometimes when they're very, very ripe and sweet, they won't even touch them and they don't like that flavor. They want them to be crunchy and they want it to be sour. And often they are eaten with salt and chili pepper. So they had to figure out how to manipulate this mango to make it palatable. And so that's what's happened. And so here, same thing in Trinidad and Tobago, they're just chopping mangoes, putting them in a bag and people were buying them. So all oh, these are green mangoes. And uh, the other good example is going to be the green mango salad. Just like in Southeast Asia, you have the papaya salad, which for the same reason, uh, papayas were eaten green uh, because they couldn't wait uh, to let them ripen. So they figured out how to eat papaya the same way they took some green mangoes. 
they add a little bit of fish sauce, a little bit of seasoning, and they make something that is very good. And if you have never had the chance to eat a good papaya salad, you are missing something very, very good. And I hate to say it, but it is very good uh, papaya salad, mango salad. Uh, and here's just mango salad with uh, some seafood. I mean, this is now more posh, uh, but it's out there and you should try it. Or just uh, the ripened mangoes. Uh, here's once again from Trinidad and Tobago. So the ones that I happened to sample when I was there. Uh, so there's some of the green mangoes. And if I had to say, where are the best mangoes in the world? I would have to give that title to Cuba. So in my trips during the summer, when it was mango season, uh, we would given were given mangoes uh, in every single meal. And yes, those were those had to be the best mangoes that I have ever had. And I had them wherever I go. Uh, and so Cuba will get my number one. Uh, pick as the best place for mangoes. And if you ever get a chance to go to Cuba, uh, try their mangoes because they are very, very good. Uh, and so here's some of the trees that you may find around Southern California. We are fortunate that our climate does allow for certain mangoes to be produced and ripen uh, attached to the tree. So here's some of the largest ones, uh, mango trees that I've come across in the city of Long Beach. Uh, including some of the ones here that are a little bit small, but they'll get to a good size pretty soon. And then there's uh, Spondias, uh, another member of this family that is known as either Jocote or June Plum or Mavlin Plum. Uh, and this is native to Central America, mainly in Guatemala, they know it quite well. And that's how this tree that is in Southgate uh, came to be, so somebody brought it uh, from South America, and it was planted and it rooted, and it's now the only true spondias that I know that is out there. And so here's when I went to visit the tree. Uh, here's the leaves as they were coming out, and here we have the flowers. And so you can see that in the middle, we have that ovary that will become the fruit later on. So when I was there to visit the tree, it was barely flowering, but it was very nice to see because I've never seen any of this kind here in Southern California. And it, it was already beginning to bear a fruit or have a fruit, so I was very happy. Uh, it was later when the fruits were delivered to me. Uh, so then I got the chance to sample and eat the fruit. Now the fruit is very sweet. And uh, it is unfortunate that inside it's a very big seed. So even though it's big in size, 95% of what you're seeing there is one gigantic seed and then the seed is covered with a little bit of pulp and the skin. And so you're gonna have to get a lot to really enjoy a good meal, but it is very sweet. And if you never had it, you may wanna consider looking for them because it's something new. Uh, those are often sold in the markets in Mexico and in Central America. Once again, they don't really bring them to the U.S. because I think they're just afraid of too many diseases or bugs inside the seeds. Or they also do not ship well because once they ripen, they become very soft and they're probably not going to make it uh, in storage or to the market where people are going to buy it. Uh, and so here's uh, where they have been offered for sale in Mexico uh, and just um, some fruits. Uh, here's some uh, from French Guiana that were offered, where I've been offered for sale in the local market. So just like we have that red one that was very sweet, once again, we have this green one that is also eaten because it's very, very sour. <clears throat> so they're being offered in uh, the market. And so here is uh, Spondias Moblin. So this is June Plum as the common name. And here's where it was growing. And uh, it is very common to see it here because the people from Southeast Asia, uh, for us is going to be the people from Cambodia, will eat the fruit when it's green. 
Once again, they will have to add some lemon and maybe some chili pepper. It is very sour. Uh, so I had to let a few ripen so they turn into this uh, yellowish color to see if they make it any sweeter. And I was disappointed that they did not. Uh, they just don't, uh, don't uh, change in flavor. They just continue to be sour, even though they're fully ripened. And inside you have a very large seed, but it does have a lot more flesh. Uh, so it's very crunchy because you're probably gonna have to eat it when it's green. Uh, and it's, it's quite good if you get some good salt and good chili pepper. Uh, and here it is when it was being offered for sale in uh, Trinidad and Tobago. So people in the tropics can, cannot afford to eat them when they're too ripen. And so the green once again becomes a desirable flavor uh, for some of these fruits. And there's when I'm holding one for scale. And so here's a few more uh, of those spondias. Uh, and then we have Harperphyllum, which is a tree that you may find around Long Beach. It is known as the African wild plum, and it is fruiting in the month of February that we are in right now. Uh, and so here's uh, North Long Beach, where you have some of the nicest tree that I've come across. Uh, here's just for similarities, the fruit that looks very similar, the flower, sorry, that looks very similar to the other. And so the fruit, when it's ripened, is gonna turn bright red uh, and it's edible. And once again, it's 95% seed, 5% pulp and skin. Uh, and then we have the pistachio or pistache tree. So pistache comes from Asia. And so here is a tree and uh, this is uh, obviously the ornamental uh, pistachios. Uh, or the real pistache needs cold climate. And so they can grow very well in Northern California or Central California, uh, but in Southern California, it does not do very well. Uh, so we are able to grow what is known as a Chinese pistache, which is an ornamental plant, but not the real pistache or pistachios. And so here's a Chinese pistache as uh, it is set in the tiny, tiny fruits that are not edible. Uh, but here's something that you also do not see every day. Here's some raw or fresh pistache. And so this is when they have the outer covering. Uh, this is when in a few uh, Mediterranean markets or markets that uh, cater to people from the Mediterranean, they often have this available. Uh, so fresh pistache. I took this seeds or the fruits from here and I grew them and yeah, I got them to germinate and they became pistache trees. Obviously I couldn't grow them here, uh, but they're viable. Uh, and so it is then that they peel them and take away the outer covering and then they roast them and or sold the, sell them raw. And that's when you get your pistache. So this is simply that fruit without the covering or the outer skin. And we know that California has a very large pistachio uh, industry and it's good for our economy. A few ornamentals now and a few shrubs. We have here smoke bush uh, that it is gonna be the big flower cluster or at least the, what holds the flowers in place that is gonna be the showy portion, including obviously the fact that this is a selection that is as the copper or the bronze color leaves, almost dark purple. Uh, and uh, when we look a little bit closer to it, uh, we can definitely see something that looks like smoke, which are the flower clusters. Uh, and uh, here are the tiny pistache looking fruit uh, or what it resembles that. Uh, and then from Chile, something more obscure, a picture from uh, Fullerton Arboretum, we have this uh, Pachycornus, which is in the uh, Anacardiaceae or the same family. And here we have a tree that is completely covered with flowers. So we know it's deciduous. And so when it decides to flowers, it's gonna have a grandiose flower display. Uh, and so here's uh, when I was able to photograph it with a very nice picture of the flowers. Uh, now, if we return to California, we have the genus Malosma, which is going to be the Laurel Sumac. 
And the Laurel sumac is a great indicator of the coastal sage scrub or the chaparral plant community here in Southern California. And so this little birdie is uh, standing and singing on top of one of those. And so here is the Laurel sumac with uh, the flowers, very, very tiny. Uh, so there's the tiny flowers. And here's the Laurel sumac in Griffith Park. And so the larger shrubs that you see here, those are gonna be the Laurel sumacs, mainly a large shrub, sometimes trained into a tree, but it's gonna be one of the larger individuals that will be growing out there. And so here's the Laurel sumac uh, when it's very happy in Griffith Park. And then we had a fire. So we know that California is now prone to fires. Well, fires are, were a common thing uh, in California communi uh, plant communities. However, when we add the human influence or the human factor where there's now human lives, human property, human homes that could be damaged, the fires were suppressed. Uh, and so when we look at a fire or the recovery after a fire, we can see something very important. We can see that the Laurel sumac, for example, is going to be a plant that is used to fire. So the plant over time develop what is known as a lignal tuber, which are buds that are going to be highly protected and sometimes they're gonna be just below the ground that the fire can go through there, burn the entire plant, but as long as those buds inside those lignotubers are safe, they will re-sprout and regenerate the plant. And so the image that you see here, we have a very large laurel sumac that is, was burnt and we begin to see some growth from some of the stems and some of the roots that are still alive and those will grow and regenerate the plant. So after a California fire, when everything is burned, this plant will be one of the first to begin to grow and begin to reestablish some of the wild vegetation that is gonna be out there. And so here it is, uh, the background, we have a tree or a plant that was completely burned and right out of the center from the lignotubers, we have a very, very nice sprouting uh, of the laurel sumac. And here it is, once again, uh, a year after a fire, some of the laurel sumacs that were completely burned have now become shrubs that are gonna be taller than a person and some of them a little bit smaller. So it doesn't take long for them to recover and resume the growth and resume and establish uh, a very large plant that will then invite the wildlife to go back because now they have an area for them to hide and now they have an area for them to make their home as well. So they're very important as far as the recovery uh, of some of the wilderness area after a fire has gone through there and has burned. Uh, and so here is uh, another year, a year after the fire, and we can see some beautiful laurel sumacs already looking very nice and very shrubby. And here's uh, Rus ovata, which is also part of our California floristic province, very common around here. This is commonly known as sugar bush. Uh, this one being lifted because of uh, the forest uh, uh, fire clearance. So just a yearly process to help uh, slow down fires that is carried out. And so this one got burned uh, during the fire and a few years later is now behaving very well and it has recovered, recovered quite nicely. Uh, so low uh, rusobata or sugar bush. So here's uh, the flowers, again, all flowers. I need to take some photograph when they are fresh. Uh, and uh, so here's the flowers for the female, the male uh, flower for the laurel sumac. Uh, and here's the, the female. Uh, flowers for those. Uh, and uh, here's uh, the fruit uh, for those. And then we have a poison oak, uh, Toxicodendrum diversolobum. So once again, in Western United States, we have poison oak. In Eastern United States, we have poison ivy. Uh, so poison oak is gonna be very common in, in wilderness area. It is an important plant for animals to feed on. 
Uh, so birds can eat the seeds without a problem and deer can eat the leaves without a problem. It is the human who, unfortunately, if they happen to come in contact with the oils, uh, then they're going to have that allergic reaction to the plant. So be very careful. The plant can be andered. The plant can hide. The plant is deciduous, which means that during the winter, it's going to drop all of the leaves. And it's just going to be a bunch of sticks. And even touching the sticks, would be a big problem if you come in contact with them. And uh, it is also a big problem if there's a fire. So when there is a fire and the plants are burning, then the smoke can carry those toxic compounds. And if the firemen happen to breathe the smoke, then once again, they would have a systemic reaction to the poison oak. And that is not a good experience for anybody to have. So be very careful if you are around poison oak, uh, if you touch it. So here is where it's changing color in the onset of uh, either it's fall or it's starting to uh, grow out. So new growth and uh, the leaves of threes, as they say. So you have uh, a, uh, the third leaflet that has a very slender uh, stem. That's gonna be very easy to diagnose in the field. And here's the flowers. Uh, for that, and there's a very close relative. This one is a skunk bush. It used to be known as Rus ovata, sorry, Rus diversifolia. Uh, and now it has a new name, but it's called a skunk bush because when you break the leaves, it has a sumac flay fragrance. And that's another thing that many members of these families, when you break the leaf, they have a, what is known as a sumac fragrance, uh, kind of a fragrance that is uh, unique to these members of the, to the members of this family. Uh, this one happens to be very strong and that's why it's referred to as skunk bush. Uh, so here's the flowers for that individual and uh, the close up. It looks very similar to poison oak. So unless you are 100% sure, please do not touch it because you could be touching the other one. Uh, and uh, here is the fruit that looks very similar to the sugar bush, although not toxic, although not poisonous, although you can touch it, uh, uh, but it's best to be sure. And here's how in the field you can tell. So if you notice that third leaflet, uh, it's going to be broader towards the base. When we saw poison oak, it was very slender. Uh, and so that is the only main difference. Uh, so if you look at that third leaflet and you look at the little stem, uh, if it's broad like this, then it's uh, skunk bush. If it's very, very narrow, then it's poison oak. And you should avoid the second one if you can. Uh, so here's just a thicket of uh, skunk bush. Uh, again, it provides good habitat for animals. It provides good food for animals. Uh, the deer can eat the leaves without a problem. And uh, Native Americans use the branches. So there was an annual gathering of the branches because they would make hats as the photograph that you see here from the Kumeye group uh, of Indians uh, that are in the Baja California area. Uh, so they're collecting the branches from the skunk bush to make those hats. Uh, so it has been used by people for uh, many, many years. Uh, and so here is uh, that poison oak. So remember that third leaflet, uh, very slender. Uh, please do not touch uh, or you're going to be sorry. It may not happen to you the first time. So usually people will say they come in contact with it. Nothing happens the first time. Then the second time they get exposed, voila. Uh, then they're going to break into a reaction. There is no such thing as an immunity. People have said that, yeah, I'm immune to it or Native Americans are immune to it. No, it, there's no such thing. You may be resistant to it right now, but as you get older, believe me, you will get it. So best to avoid it if you can. Uh, and there's uh, the uh, skunk bush. So we have a very slender for uh, poison oak, do not touch. And we have a little bit broader or a lot broader for skunk bush. You can touch this one if you can or you want. Uh, and then we have uh, the other roots or uh, the sumacs. So here is uh, uh, the African sumac, uh, Roos triloba. 
Uh, and so we have uh, here the leaf uh, and uh, the beginnings of the flowers, which are going to be very similar to all the others. And then here we have the fruit, which are going to be similar to the others, except they are dry, uh, not edible, nothing really good for that. And so with that, I will leave you with some of the best things about this uh, plant family. So obviously we have some pistachio ice cream, which I'm sure if you're not allergic to members of this family, you can enjoy that. We have some mango ice cream. That is also very good. If you are not allergic to this uh, individuals, we have cashews uh, ice cream. That's very good if you're not allergic to these individuals. Or we have the many trail mixes with tropical mangoes and cashews if you happen to not be allergic to this family group. And so with that, I will end it and say have a great day. Bye.